Hey everybody, Nyasha here. So today I got a special treat for you. We're doing an updated Succession Mewa guide. And this is because of the recent changes that happened on February 15th. You can check those out by going under Adventure Support, Notice. And then when this pops up, you go to February 15th Patch Notes. And then navigate to the Mewa class. And you can see all the changes represented here. As you see, there is a ton of changes. So feel free to check that out. I went over it pretty in depth on the Global Lab um, video that I did recently about a week ago or two weeks ago. So make sure you check that out if you are wanting more in depth. Uh, but I'm not going to spend time going over every little detail on this particular video because it's mostly focusing on just getting everyone caught up on the mechanics of the class. So make sure to check that out. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get into the main mechanic revolving around succession, and that is Red Blade. Red Blade ultimately enhances our skills, specific skills, and augments them to have either more protection or more damage, or even changes the skill to do something a little bit different than what it originally did. An example would be Red Moon. Red Moon was more of a melee oriented skill, it became a mid range skill when you're in Red Blade. Um, now, Red Blade is actually represented visually two different ways. There's a UI element, Red Blade right here. This will represent how many petals you have and then also represent when you're in Red Blade state. And then you'll also get a buff on your buff bar that will represent Red Blade as well. Um, and this will show a little red icon with two buffs that go with it, um, an all AP buff and an a all accuracy buff. So now that we have an understanding of what Red Blade is and what it does in a very high level sense, um, how do you get into Red Blade? So Red Blade is achieved a few different ways, but the main way that I'm going to show you is utilizing Chase to get two petals. You need two petals, and then you also need a third final petal, which can only be done via two skills. It's either Dragon Bite or Decapitation. So we're going to use Chase to get the two small petals and then Dragon Bite or Decapitation to enter Red Blade State. So that's essentially how it works. Now, originally, before the patch, um, Chase could only give you a petal if it was off cooldown. Now it'll give you a petal off and on cooldown. So do two chases, get two petals. Look at that. Two chases, two petals. Easy peasy. Not hard at all. So we have our two petals now, but we're not in Red Blade state. And like I mentioned, in order to enter Red Blade state, you need to either use Dragon Bite or Decapitation. So the Dragon Bite is as such. And that'll give us a, a big, large petal here, or a flower blade, if you will, it's a red blade. And then we get our buff on our buff bar and the all accuracy and all AP buff that I mentioned previously. Now, this state lasts for 30 seconds, and so do the buffs that go with it, okay? You can re-up and keep up Red Blade by utilizing the same skill, either Dragon Bite or Decapitation. So that's the Dragon Bite version. You can exit, you can exit Red Blade if you use Mewa's Will, which if you go to Mewa's Will, and you look at the succession portion, it allows you to absorb Red Blade and you gain 300 HP, but you keep the buffs, okay? So, may as well, we exited Red Blade, our icon's gone, that's how we can exit Red Blade at will. So now I'm gonna show going into Red Blade with decapitation. We are in Red Blade again via decapitation, okay? I'm gonna exit. And you can still use Dragon Bite to gain initial petals or Decapitation to, gain, to gain initial petals as well, but they're obviously not as efficient. It takes a lot longer, you're more vulnerable. It's just a waste of your time to get the small petals with those skills. It's just better to use Chase because it's just, look, we're done. We got our two petals. So that's the idea. The whole objective is to get these small petals and then use dragon bite or decapitation now me personally and how i'm going to teach you is use dragon bite only if you can help it now i can't really think of a scenario where decapitation would actually be better to use but 
Um, maybe within a combo, if Red Blade for some reason ran out, which it should never. But Dragon Bite is going to 99% of the time be the ideal way to enter Red Blade State, in my personal opinion. Okay. After the 30 seconds is on, it'll obviously go. All our bus will go as well. So let's say we want to enter Red Blade State quickly. I'm going to show you how that's done. Now I'm in Red Blade and I did a CC on a target. I did a stiff with Dragon Bite and that allows me to then begin comboing an opponent. So let's say we want to go ahead and hit that training dummy. We're not in Red Blade at all. So we're going to go ahead and enter Red Blade and then combo it. So we just did a combo right there by getting into Red Blade via Dragon Bite, which also stiffed our opponent. And then we did Red Moon, which floated our opponent. And then we did Blooming to nuke our opponent, essentially. So that is one example of an ideal way to enter into Red Blade State and then utilize Red Blade. All right, so in this section, I'm going to go ahead and show you some combo examples. This isn't all of them. Um, it would be a long ass video, and it already is, um, if I tried to include every single combo I knew. It's just to kind of give you a baseline example of what you can do. That way you can kind of build off that yourself and utilize combos that you create on your own. Sark's trying to grab oh, me. So oh I think no, Sark is he's grabbed. Fucking screwed. Right, monkey right, grabbed. Right. Monkey grabbed. Huge CC. Huge CC. CC. All right, so in this section, we're going to get into SA Lingers. Um, these are going to be important for certain PvP situations because you might need to stay protected, but you might not necessarily have any offensive skills to respond with. Or maybe you need to regenerate your stamina or insert reason here. Um, basically, there's three SA Lingers that we're interested in. One does not require Red Blade State. 
the other two do require red blade state. The one that does not is whirlwind cut. Whirlwind cut. Um, I'm going to use some stamina here to represent it. But whirlwind cut actually does use stamina and it prevents regeneration of stamina. So it uses 50 stamina per swing and it does not allow you to regenerate stamina while you use it. So be mindful of that when you're utilizing this linger. You can do one single swing or you can continue to do the other two swings because it actually does three, sw three swings. But the last one, when you finish it, it does a CC stiff and it does not keep you SA lingered. So be mindful if you're going to do all three. As you've seen, the third one drops it off right away. So if you're going to linger whirlwind cut, make sure you do at least one or two. All right. Uh, the next one, we're going to go ahead and enter red blade state. And we have uh, some stamina that we need to regen. And we're going to go ahead and use red moon. So as you'll notice, red moon has this really elongated linger and our stamina bar fully recovered from half. So it's a really good linger. And we'll go ahead and use more stamina just to show it again. So we basically got 50% of our stamina bar back during the entire animation. So it's a really good linger. Um, it's got a 7 second cooldown SA. And it has some decent damage and a float CC if you happen to catch someone. So it's a really good linger to use. <clears throat> And uh, one I, I typically use when I'm actually in a situation where I'm out of stamina. If you don't have the threat of being grabbed, I would recommend utilizing it if you can take the damage. Uh, the other linger that you can do is Divider. Um, divider uses stamina, and it will continue to use stamina as you use it. So I'll go ahead and show that. And during the usage, it'll prevent you from regenerating stamina. But as you see, I can continue it as long as I have stamina to spend. Now, how it normally looks is like is uh, like this until it expends all your stamina. But if you slow tap it, you don't have to utilize all your stamina. You could just do little small amounts and then keep up a linger. So those are the three um, SA lingers that we have that I recommend using. All right, in this section, we're going to go over the iframes that we have. So we have basically one on-demand iframe, and we have one that's built into our chase. Um, I'll show that. Charged... Uh, stub arrow evasive shot is our um, iframe on demand um, as long as you have arrows um, with utilizing stub arrow you can actually utilize charged evasive shot so I currently have not activated my arrows but I can use an arrow right away and use evasive shot so how this works is it got changed to where it currently has no collision it used to have collision so you'll actually go through players and objects um, that are not um, indestructible objects. And you will be able to twirl through them, evade their attack, and actually respond with a charged stub arrow, uh, which will actually CC stiff. So it looks like this. If I am to go through this mob... And because of the twirl, you can actually manipulate your camera to kind of get the twirl to do a few different things. Like, for example, say I need to maybe get away from this target. I can cut twirl backwards a little bit by manipulating my camera. And uh, you can do stuff like that. Now, the cool thing about the change, not only did they do the um, animation change, the where the twirl is a little bit wider than what it used to be and the fact that it has no collision those are really good but it's a now a two second cooldown this is huge this is a massive change and it gives us an actual really good in my opinion on-demand iframe 
I think it's actually pretty solid now. It used to be pretty bad because of the collision and the fact that it had a very short twirl, so it ended up twirling to dodge a skill, but if they did an elongated skill that had multiple CCs, you didn't go anywhere, so you just get hit by it anyways because you can't cancel the arrow. Personally, I, I wish they would allow us to cancel the arrow, but this is what we have. Um, still really good skill in my opinion. I think it's definitely been much improved. Um, if you want to use it on the first time, the actual the actual uh, key binds for it is just using A or um, A or D and then right click. But if you are using it without an arrow already available, you need to do Shift A or D and then right click. The reason why is because you need to actually like shoot a stub arrow, but instead it ends up doing a normal um, evasive shot twirl. And then after that, you don't need to hold shift anymore. You can just do the normal A or A or D with right click. So very useful iframe. Uh, the other iframe is chase, like I mentioned, um, but this is not one that's easy to control. Uh, basically, when chase is off cooldown, it is an iframe. That's really it. Uh, there's nothing else other than that to say about it. Um, as I am off off cooldown with chase right now you'll see that it goes iframe into super armor that's ultimately how it looks when it's off cooldown when you're chasing normally it's super armor when it's off cooldown transitions but then when it eventually comes off cooldown again it goes randomly iframe then super armor then iframe super armor it, it does that so it's not like an iframe that you can really depend on on demand But those are our major iframes. There's also an iframe on Tiger Blade activation. Um, and I use this sometimes in PvP. Say like you're stuck in a mystic vacuum. This is a good time to maybe pop this. It uses an iframe. And if you have attack speed slows on you, it really elongates the animation. So the iframe will last longer. So you can utilize that to maybe escape a situation. Maybe you have no stamina left. You can use Tiger Blade to get out of that horrible situation and then use Tiger Blade uh, to run away. So yeah, that's our iframes. All right, so in this section, we're gonna go over movement for the Mewa class. Um, movement is relatively easy compared to most classes. We don't really have a combo chain for moving. Um, so it's really easy and allows us to focus on actually CCing our opponent and comboing rather than focusing on a movement combo. So that's pretty nice. Uh, movement primarily is done by chase, but there are a few other skills that we utilize for movement sometimes as well, and I'll go over all those. Chase is done via right click. Right click will do a back chase by default, and if you do forward right click, it'll do a forward chase. The main differences between forward chase and back chase is forward chase has collision. So if you run into a teammate or enemy player, you're going to have collision on them. Back chase does not have collision. All right. The other main thing about Chase is every three seconds, it is now off cooldown, which means it gains an iframe on its use, on its first very first use, and then it swaps to super armor at the lingering portion of it. Um, when it's on cooldown, it'll be super armor. And then if you continue to chase it super armor, it will transition randomly after it goes off cooldown to iframe and then super armor again. So that is how Chase works. You can use A, D, and your camera to help alter the direction of your chase. So that could be useful at times um, if you need to position a very specific way. So something to keep note there. Really easy movement, really free flowing. Um, not too much really to be said there. The other forms of movement we have are grapple arrow. And grapple arrow is a six second cooldown it's super armor and it has a knockback effect if you actually connect the actual attack portion of it with a target. So typically when I'm maneuvering around an opponent, I'm utilizing chase and then I'll grapple arrow sometimes to create distance uh, from a particular scenario because grapple arrow actually travels farther than two chases and it costs 100 stamina versus two chases costing around 200 stamina. So it could allow you to create some much needed distance between you and your opponent, especially if you have movement slows on you. Grapple is an attack speed based uh, movement skill. So movement slows don't impact its ability to send you to your destination 
quickly. Another form of movement would be in the uh, skill enhancements, and that's Blooming Step. This is a 22 second cooldown for guard ability. Um, it allows you to jump off uh, cliffs safely without having a fall animation, as long as the cliffs aren't really, really high. Um, so if they're reasonable, uh, let's say we jump off this platform here. All right, I'll demonstrate the fall animation first. So if I go to chase, I got a little fall animation. Um, with using Blooming Step, however, you will not get that. And then you can freely chase. So, something to kind of keep note of there. Um, it is a foreguard though, so if you don't have very good positioning with your opponent and they happen to catch you in the back with a CC, you're going to get caught and probably die. So just be mindful of that. Uh, very situational movement, in my opinion. Um, other forms of movement would be blind thrust. So sometimes I use blind thrust. Um, and the reason why is because it's an attack based skill. So if I have a lot of slows on me and grapple arrow isn't available, like movement slows, I can use blind thrust to maybe kind of create a little bit of distance in a situation, um, you know, relatively easily. It is unsafe. So there's a good chance you could get CC'd. So it's very, very situational, like basically do or die. If you just stand there, you're going to die. And if you don't do anything, you're going to die. Um, so you might as well risk it for the biscuit kind of thing. Get Try to see if you can get out of that situation. So Another form of movement would be Stigma or Frost Faint as it's been renamed. Prime Frost Faint. Um, I like to use this for movement because it actually travels quite far. And if you just press C, it'll actually do Frost Faint. So generally like if I'm maneuvering around an opponent I'm like chasing and then I might use stigma uh, to also create a little bit of distance it does have a stab CC at the end of it which is unprotected that you can't cancel so just be mindful with your positioning of it but uh, the main reason to kind of use this one is it actually doesn't have a stamina cost associated with it so it's kind of nice it's a good movement and as long as you use it for you know positioning away from your opponent you know it's relatively safe so, um, just something to keep in mind there with utilizing Stigma for movement. And that should be it for the movement based portion. I'm going to show an example clip of utilizing the movement against a warrior. So in this section, we're going to go over AOS uh, mindset, play style, um, and kind of just give you food for thought on how you should probably approach the fight. It isn't necessarily 100% this is how you win all the time. It's just an idea, concept to give you perspective on how I approach the fight and how some other Mewas that I know approach the fight, um, such as Neptunes and uh, um, Akari. Um, so when it comes to playing an AOS, <clears throat> Suck Mewa is not a frontliner, so being up in everyone's face is not realistically good for you, um, especially if they're skilled players. They're going to take advantage of that. They're going to slow you. They're going to chip you down. They're going to catch you and kill you. So we need to play kind of like a mid-range melee and long-range uh, CC fishing type of play style. Um, I kind of just call it a dive and dump type playstyle. Basically, you're hoping that you have teammates that can CC your opponents relatively consistently, which gives you opportunities to dive in with all your cooldowns available and just drop them all on one target, delete that target, back off, reset, rinse, repeat. So a dive and dump um, is how I like to explain it. But there aren't always... Um, going to be team comps that allow for that kind of play style. So there might be times where you don't really have a good comp for um, getting easy CCs. Maybe you don't have any grabs on your team or maybe the team you're fighting against is like fully protected all the time and it's just a pain to actually CC them. 
Um, so you might need to play a little bit different of a role than a dive and dump type strategy. Uh, you might need to be a little bit more active when it comes to CCing opponents. So being a little bit more aggressive with, say, Red Moon, fishing for CCs that are safe, um, utilizing Stub Arrow um, as much as you can, Cyclone slash Decapitating Cyclone for ranged uh, potential float CCs. Um, those are going to be safe and good ways to actually land CCs on your opponent and potentially open up opportunities for you and your team. Um, Another good method is when your team actually uh, gets a CC on a target and combos them, if that target Vs, drop what you're doing and sniff for the V. Try to find that V target, and whenever they come out of their V, catch them, kill them, get rid of them right away. That is basically a standard strategy for every team comp, but... Some team comps can't pull that off as effectively because they don't have very good movement. Mewa has pretty good movement, so we're able to cover a lot of distance really quickly and potentially sniff out our opponent's Vs, kill them, and then put a 3v3 situation into a 3v2 situation. At which point, when you're in those situations where you have an advantage, play into your advantage, play very safely, play slow, let them, the two that are left on the opponent's side, play into you. That's the better way to do it, typically, because generally speaking, if you're expending your resources to go to them to kill them off, well, they haven't ex expended their resources. So they have more to work with skill-wise, resource-wise, to combat you. Now, that's not necessarily always the case, but it's a general rule of thumb, in my opinion. Um, so that's the kind of uh, strategies and situations that you're going to probably need to play into when uh, queuing up for AOS and doing ranked. Um, it's definitely uh, not something like I mentioned that's like set in stone, like, you know, things change and then all of a sudden our play style might change completely. Like, for example, Succession may well got all these changes recently on February 15th. Suddenly we're fully protected across the board when it comes to our combo so we have a lot safer dive and dump strategy than we did previously uh, so those things are going to be ever changing ever adapting based on uh, you know the state of the game if it you know things change dramatically but um, those are some ideas to think about gameplay wise for AOS um, I'm gonna go ahead and show an example um, clip of a game and hopefully that'll give you some perspective. All right, so I'm gonna use this fight as an example of how you should have your mindset when trying to play an AOS with Succession Mewa. So we have a pretty good comp here. We've got a warrior frontliner with DP spec, Gosu as Awakening, Zerker, and me as Suck Mewa. So you wanna play back like how I am, utilizing your range abilities, waiting for a grab opportunity like that. And then you can go in and dump all your damage. Now in this example, we actually got a nice kill really early. So that already put us ahead in a really good situation. And then we got a sniff out of it. This is a, <laughs> a very, very successful situation. It doesn't always end up this way, but I thought it was a, you know, it's still a good example to demonstrate um, how you should kind of approach the fight. And then here's the following rounds. And this round, it doesn't go quite as good, um, but it ends up uh, with a positive. So Liger here, unfortunately, gets caught and then KD'd and then comboed immediately really hard. I almost, and in my attempt to peel, uh, get caught and killed in the process, but I managed to V just in time and got out with like basically no HP left. So I have to full reset. So in these scenarios, I'm trying to support Gosu, but also trying to make sure that I'm staying range oriented. Um, there isn't too much I can apply pressure wise right here except for range CCs so I need to focus on recovering and just you know making sure that I'm not getting caught because Gosu will be by himself otherwise so we're just biding our time playing safe uh, you know utilizing the range abilities that I have and then waiting for an opportunity I got a stiff right there on Mamo, which allowed me to combo him, and then I actually ended up getting the striker too in the process. Me and Gosu managed to take out the striker, and that was a very, very nice situation. I got caught right there trying to divide myself versus the DK. Luckily, Gosu came in with that save. 
We full reset from the situation because I have no stamina. I was a little low on HP, so I wanted to recover and reset the situation. Plus, no cooldowns. Then get we get engaged on here, and I'm noticing I have no stamina, and they're gonna hard engage on me. So I go into Tiger Blade, which allows me to stay in full super armor, and allows me to continue chasing around very safely while I regenerate my stamina. So in this situation, we're just kind of fishing for CCs using our ranged abilities versus their non-ranged oriented uh, gameplay. And uh, just getting the fight in our, our favor. We're basically trying to control this fight. And we're doing a fairly good job of it. DK tries to go on me. Mamo's also looking for an opportunity where he sees one. And then Gosu manages to, I believe, yep, get uh, the DK here. Calls for help. And I come in, do what I can. Before Mamo comes in, I back off. And then I re-jump in after he misses his CC attempt. And that's when we kill HP. So those kinds of things are what you kind of want to look out for when playing in AOS. All right, in this section here, we're going to go over PVE really quickly. I'm not going to go too in-depth with this. Um, when it comes to PVE, when it's really low in spots that basically the mobs get one shot and there's a lot of pack-to-pack -pack movement, succession doesn't do as great. Uh, Awakening is actually better equipped to deal with a uh, pack-to-pack movement um, that's consistent. Like, you kill one pack with one skill, and then you go on to the next pack. Eventually, what happens is Succession will run out of stamina, and you're going to be stamina-gated. And uh, it kind of kind of messes with your clear speed um, a bit. So, if you're looking for st stuff on that, pack-to-pack like, -pack movement on one-shot... Um, spots is there's not really much to go over you just do whatever skill you want like red moon uh, four blind thrust decap um, and uh, those those things will basically kill those packs so there's, there's really not much to go over with those um, just understand that their stamina is going to be a problem when doing uh, those zones so awakening is technically better better equipped to handle that now when it comes to doing uh, more mid tier or high end zones um, you can do certain combos um, that uh, will basically allow you to be efficient with your damage. Um, common examples would be first you want to enter Red Blade right away, so always make sure you're in Red Blade state first. And then I usually start off with doing four blind thrust, uh, decapitation, sticky snowflake. And then from there you can kind of mix it up and do whatever you feel is comfortable for you. But I, I usually will do like Carver, um, Red Moon, Blooming, and then Magnus Skill, which is Razor Blade Corolla. So it'll look something like this. And that's a pretty standard combo to use on uh, mid tier to high tier packs. Um, now, something to note make sure when you're doing these kinds of uh, combos and utilizing your skills, you're trying to focus on back attacks because that's going to help increase your clear speed. Um, back attacks will just give you an extra 50% of your damage towards your towards your towards each skill that you do, so it's going to help you clear a lot faster. Um, so make sure you do that. I'm going to go ahead and show an example of me doing Gyphons uh, to kind of demonstrate. Uh, mind you, I am buffed up pretty well um, and my gear is actually pretty high so it's not going to be as fast for uh, players that aren't necessarily uh, that geared um, but it's mostly just a representation it's not just to show you how it's going to exactly look for you in your gear situation at your grind spot situation it's just to give you an example
All right, so in this section here, we're going to go over the skills and add-ons. I'm going to show you the bare minimum you need to function uh, for PvE and PvP. Um, you're not going to have everything, but it'll be the minimum that you need. Um, so as you see, I only have 2,964 skill points only. Um, you only need to use 965 skill points for the minimum. Um, examples would be Absolute Slash or Absolute Slice, um, Prime Divider, uh, Backstab, um, Prime uh, Blind Thrust, Absolute Nemesis Slash, Prime Slash or Prime Blind Slash, uh, Prime Whirlwind Cut, uh, Prime Carver, Prime Decapitation, Prime Dragon Bite. You don't need Absolute Claw or Dragon Claw or Lunar Slash or Garbage. Um, Prime Red Moon is definitely worth getting because you're going to be spamming that in both PvP and PvE. Um, Absolute uh, Cyclone Slash is worth getting for PvP specifically. If you don't have any plans on doing PvP, you can drop that. Um, all the arrow play is worth getting for PvP. And you can utilize it in PvE, but it's not really truly meant for PV PvE. So this could probably save you around 50 points or so if you get rid of charge of prime charge sub arrow but i highly recommend getting it in all the arrow play for that matter it's all really good um prime blooming definitely worth getting razor blade which is our magnus skill worth getting um it's an okay four guard but it's it's worth it we need four guards for succession um e buff is worth getting prime uh, frost faint and petal swirl which is our cd skills they're worth getting uh, absolute male's will is definitely worth getting um, absolute roundhouse kick is the only kick I would ever recommend you use. It is our only KD in this in this uh, succession kit, so worth getting for that for PvP. Uh, make sure you get chase. Tiger blade is worth getting. Uh, lock evasion uh, forward roll here. This evasion roll just block it. Um, get all the passes. I didn't add in weight training because that literally takes a metric fuck ton of points. As you'll see, that took like 1,500 points right there. So without that, you only need around 965. So this is something you get later down the road. Um, then for the skill enhancements, um, Ultimate May was Will, Blooming Stride or Blooming Step, either or. It's a personal preference thing. I like the minus 50% movement speed. Uh, Blooming Step has a, a further distance that it travels, and it can jump off cliffs uh, fairly safely without causing fall animation, so it's worth utilizing for that. Decapitating Cyclone is the way to go. Decapitating Dragon is garbage. Do not get confused by that attack speed plus 15%. It's not worth it. And then we'll get into the PvE add-ons. PvE add-ons are as such. Um, if you go Evasion, the Blind Thrust is actually going to be useful in PvE if mobs are hitting you a lot. Because uh, early on, Evasion is probably not recommended to go because you just don't have enough of it. But... If you decided to go that route anyways, um, throwing all evasion rate and then all accuracy minus 4% on your targets will help you survive a little bit better. Um, the rest of these are, they got a little bit of redundancy, but it's just to maintain the, the buffs that we actually need for our PvE. So, really simplistic there. And then for PvP... Um, these are the add-ons I choose. Um, they work pretty well for me. I do a lot of redundancy with like um, all DP minus 15 because not in every situation am I going to utilize the same abilities. Sometimes I might throw out Red, Red Moon just to like do some mid-range uh, chip damage to a target that's on the ground to help finish them off. And I won't necessarily be able to do Carver, for example, for a DP shred. So... It might be nice to have a little bit of extra damage on Red Moon to make sure I secure that kill, as an example. Same thing with Blooming. Sometimes I do Blooming as a one-off skill to mana drain people, so I wanted to kind of chunk people if I can. And then Carver's our main, uh, our main skill that we use for uh, DP Shred. If you go to Carver, it does minus 20 DP naturally. Same applies to Whirlwind Cut, so both of these skills are good for maybe throw an additional add-on for minus 15 DP. So that's the main gist behind my PVP setup. 
All right, everybody, that's it for the guide. I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully it helped you understand Succession Mewa a bit more and got you to a point where you can comfortably use it um, and start experimenting yourself. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment. Otherwise, feel free to give the video a like if you liked it and sub if you'd like to see more content. See you, everybody.